Well, good morning, everyone. We'll give you a special welcome today. We have visitors today. I think we've only visitors from Oxford today, so we give a welcome to our visitors from Oxford. Lovely seeing you in church. If I've missed out anyone, shout. No. Just to say one or two uh, things before we start. On Friday, Alec and Jane, who sit uh, over there, Jane was taken into Dr. Gray's and then and then into Aberdeen and on Friday night she, Alec put a message back from theatre two stents put in and yesterday a uh, message to Alec he says Jane home making a fantastic recovery so thank you for praying for Jane and continue to pray for Alec and Jane also remember next week pray for Ian who is preaching next Sunday evening remember you Ian and also Laurie Chancellor's coming for Inverness. He speaks on behalf of Release International and there will be a collection at the door uh, for Release and also to say that there's a picnic lunch next week uh, afterwards. I'll just read this card out uh, from Linda Gordon and family to Graham and all our church family. Thank you so much for the beautiful cards and caring messages sent to us over these past days following the passing of my dear dad. Your support is a real comfort and encouragement to us all. A very special thank you to those who braved the wind and rain of Storm Babbitt to come to the funeral service itself. Your presence was very much appreciated. It's been a hard week, but our God is faithful and his love is never ending. We trust my dad into his tender care, Linda Gordon and family. Also, just to mention, is that it's a very special day for Mavis and John because their grandson Samuel is being baptized tonight in Manchester and he's 16 so it's great to hear that so before I read let's pray for Samuel or God thank you for the baptism of Samuel thank you for a young a young man 16 who is stepping out and not ashamed to be a believer and to belong and show that he loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray that you will bless Samuel tonight and pray that you will use his life mightily for you, our God. Thank you for Mavis and John. Thank you for the joy they bring into our church family and thank you for the encouragement to them. So we pray your blessing upon Samuel in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll read God's word to start with because with everything that's happening in the world, it's a great thing to be reminded from Psalm 93, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunder of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. And that leads us into our opening hymn where we will sing the splendor of the King and the words, how great is our God. The Lord reigns.
Lord reigns. Our God, we come before you this morning. God of all grace, God who is rich in mercy, because of the great love wherewith he loved us. We come, our God, and give you thanks that we can sing these words. How great is our God. That we can read from your word to be reminded this morning that all that is happening in our world that seems so broken, we thank you, our God, that your throne remains immovable and the Lord reigns. Thank you, our God, for your plans and your purposes. And today we pray for our broken world and we pray, our God, for the war in Israel and Gaza and we just pray, our God, for peace. We think of the sorrowing, we think of the death, we think of the destruction, we think of all that is going on and we plead with you, our God. Along with millions of Christians, we are pleading, our God, for your mercy and we're pleading, our God, that you will put a stop to this. We pray, our God, for Ukraine and Russia. Again, just reading the news last night of 16 killed, six postal workers killed. We just think of the ongoing sorrow in these countries. Our God, we think of how you're a preserver of all men and we pray for peace in the troubled regions of our world, in the countries where there are civil wars going on. We pray, our God, for the countries where there is great poverty. We pray for the refugee camps. Our God, this morning we remember the Christians who are persecuted and we remember the church, the suffering church in countries like Pakistan and China and North Korea. We remember it in the Middle East. And yet, our God, we thank you that you reign. Although we cannot understand why things are allowed, we thank you for that great truth that we have read that the Lord reigns. We pray, our God, for us as a church this morning. And we do give you thanks for the past week and the help given to Graham and Anne and the family and to Gordon and Linda and the family. And we continue to pray for comfort to be upon them. We thank you for seeing Jane through her operation. And we pray for Alexander and Jane. And we thank you for the way that they so faithfully come to the church. And we just pray, our oh God, that they will have found at this troubled time of worry their strength in you, in the Lord Jesus Christ. We do remember each person gathered here. We think of those who have real worry at this time. And we think of Janice and we pray for our daughter-in-law, Vicky, and we commit Vicky to you. We pray for healing upon her. We pray for Helen and Alan. We think of Helen's worry over her nephew, Ian, and we pray for Ian and Kim. Our God, we pray for us as we gather this morning. Thank you for all present and we just pray. Pray for those searching today. Pray they will find. The search will be f end today as they find the Lord Jesus as Savior. We do pray for those struggling. Pray, our oh God, that you will strengthen them. Pray for those who have come in and they're feeling downcast. Pray, Lord, that you will lift them up. Pray for those who feel so burdened uh, this morning as they sit. We just pray, our oh God, that you will lift that burden. Our oh God, we pray for those who are sorrowing and we think of how time moves on and yet the miss in life. And we just pray, our oh God, for comfort for those who sorrow. We pray for the widows and the widows amongst us. We commit them prayerfully to you, our oh God. We pray that as a church this morning, we will indeed with a young or old, encounter you speaking in your word. And we pray, our oh God, that you will help us to listen to your word and help us to be obedient to your word and help us to be followers, true and bright and real followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. And for this, our oh God, we pray today that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit, that indeed we will be a church where there is love and compassion and kindness to each other, that we will be a church that shines for the Lord Jesus. We will be a church that shares the good news of the Lord Jesus. Our God, we bow before you this morning. The God who reigns, we bow in adoration before you. We bow in worship before you. We adore you. We love you. We praise you, our God, in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. 
Psalm 57 Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me, for in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God Most High, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I lie among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in my distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. 
My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. If you have your Bibles open, um, it's important for us as we go through to see what God is saying and to turn and just go through, we'll go through it virtually verse by verse. Psalm 57. I remember when I was a wee boy, I used to come out of school and run down to my granny and grandas. And they stayed near the harbour in Portnoke in Gordon Street. And I used to run down and look in the window and my memory of my granny and grandad, one of my memories is lights never been on and them sleeping. And looking in the window and the fire just about out. The fire always seemed to just to be about out. And I used to creep in and tiptoe and I knew where the matches were and get the matches and meet my friends and we would go down into the caves in Portnoke, down at, I still remember going down into the one in the harbour and going into the back of the cave, not right into the back, because into the right into the back, you always imagined there was something in the back of the cave. But, and we used to light fires in the cave and get things, and it was good fun, fun in the cave. But David here, where we're reading, is, you'll notice at the very beginning, to the choir master according to Do Not Destroy, a victim of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave. This was not a cave of fun. And neither was it a cave. Sometimes you go on holiday, you can pay money and get a tour of caves. But this is nay, David is a tourist in a cave here. This is David fleeing, from his, fleeing for his life from King Saul. When David was a young boy, he, a young lad, he was taken from the fields and he was anointed to be the future king of Israel. He heard the words, and not arise, anoint him, for this is he. And then in chapter, in that chapter, we see David as he faced Goliath. And then in chapter 18, all Judah, it says, and Israel loved David and they sang to him. He was a great warrior. He was much loved in Israel. But King Saul was jealous of David. And as we saw last week, David had to flee for his life. And David's life was filled in this period of great uncertainty. And when David was in that cave, David, when he heard uh, of that he would be king, he did not expect to be found in a cave. This was not in David's plan for his life to be fleeing for his life, hunted by Saul, King Saul and his army. David's life very much hanging in the balance. This wasn't what David expected when he was anointed to be the next king of Israel. It wasn't in David's plan, but God allowed it because it was in God's plan. And that's like your life and my life today. The things that happen, this was a storm. And whether it's a physical storm that we see or metaphorically speaking of the storms that come into our life. We did not think when we became a Christian that this would have happened or this would have been allowed to happen. But they were allowed to happen and they were part of God's plan and purpose for our life. We did that in 1 Samuel where I emphasize in chapter 1, twice it says, the Lord closed the womb of Sarah, eh, sorry, Hannah. Twice it says that. And that verse has been a great comfort to me in Samuel. And maybe something is happening in your life this morning or has happened in your life. Like David, you didn't expect it to happen and it's happened 
and it's happening at this present time. And one thing about the cave experiences in our life like David is there can be a lonely experience. There can be a hard experience. There can be an experience where you can feel almost forgotten. They can feel, you can feel in the cave, you almost feel the aloneness of David as, he's, as he is hiding in the cave. And I want to break this down into two things today, which is verse 1 to 5 is David's prayer to God, and verse 6 to 11 is David's praise to God. And David decided to do two things. He decided to pray, and he decided to praise and the very first thing is I've done is David's confidence in verse 1 is David's confidence in God's protection. David, as Louise asked the children, it's lovely, but their answers is they would tell their mom, or dad, or granny, which is so nice, but David hitting his mom or dad or granny in that cave. But what did David? David had God. We did that last week when David, his faith was weak and he was feigning himself mad. What did David do? He says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. And what's David doing here? He is turning to God in prayer. Christians, what a privilege it is to have prayer. Philippians 4, I, since I've preached it, I've, I practice it. I did before that, but I practice it even more where I spoke of these, these things where God says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Great. And I said that, share it, leave it, and receive God's peace. And you know, that's my experience of turning to God in times of trouble, in these cave experiences. My son Peter asked me recently to watch David Beckham's Netflix documentary. And I know it doesn't sound, maybe for those of you, maybe on the end of football, or on the end of David and Victoria Beckham in any way, that it wouldn't be worth watching. Do you know, I loved it. And if you get the chance, watch part two, it's an hour, of David Beckham's documentary. And what the part two is, he got sent off playing for England against Argentina in the 1998 World Cup. He kicked out to Simeone, uh, the Argentinian player, he got sent off. And the, the documentary, that hour, is about his experience in the years after and it was almost unbelievable, the hatred and everything that was in his life. I was, the surprise is that he survived it. But David Beckham, I think in episode three, blasphemed, and he's now a Christian. But the thing that came out to me was this, in his experience there, he did not turn to God. He did not turn to God in prayer because he did not know God. What a mess that is in your life to have no God to turn to. But David does, and he says, Be gracious unto me, O God, be, gracious, be merciful to me, sorry, for in you my soul takes refuge. And he pictures the picture of a wee bird going under the wings of its mother. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. Beautiful picture, isn't it? When World, War, when World War I began, my granddad was called John and his brother was called Peter. And they were outside just playing like boys, out playing with their chums. And his mom heard that World War I had begun. So she went out she was only in her 30s. Her husband was at sea. And she went out and called her two sons. They were just little, little boys. And took them in. She took them in for her friends. She took them and made them kneel down. And she went and got her Bible. 
And she opened her Bible with her two boys kneeling by her side. And this is what she read. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. She closed her Bible, she prayed for her boys, she opened the door and put them back out to play. And I thought that was so beautiful because it's just a picture of the trust of placing our boys and placing our lives under the shadow of God's wings. David might have been like my, me. I learned this from my granda, uh, this here, this psalm. But David's great granda and great granny, if it wasn't a preaching, I would say, a sweetie out the rumble, rumble, jumble box. If you get this, but I'm there, so it's okay. His great granda and his great granny was David and sorry, Boaz and Ruth. And what happened there was that when Ruth the Moabitess was converted and came into the land of Israel, what were the words that Ruth heard from Boaz, Boaz that first day in the field? The God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Maybe this is why David, it was passed down. But David is this protection of being under God's wings. None of us are born in this. We're not born under the wings of the protection of God. Is we didn't belong to God. If anything, John chapter 3 speaks of being uh, the wrath of God abiding upon us. That we are under the wrath of God. We are actually, the Bible says, we are far off from God. We are alienated. We are separated. We are enemies of God. So what happened? What happened is that God loved us. Is that the Lord Jesus Christ died upon the cross for us. And through believing in the Lord Jesus, through repentance and trusting in Christ as our Savior, we have what it says, what happens is what it says in Ephesians chapter 2. That you who once were afar off are brought near by the blood of Christ. And we are brought near by the blood of Christ. We are now embraced by a merciful, loving God and we are forgiven. And that is a great thought that we are now taken from being the wrath of God abiding upon us as sinners because we have trusted in Christ. We are now under the shadow of his wings and that happens when we're saved. And let me ask you today, are you saved? Have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior? Last Sunday night, I had to go up late at night to pick up my two sons for the, the station. And Keith is 20 minutes. But I decided to go 35 minutes. And I'm glad I did because we've got a badger that comes into the garden. And he digs up the garden. But... I didn't like running down badgers. And I was glad I drove slow because there was two badgers on the road and I missed them, which I was really glad that I missed them. But that's not the reason I drove at 35, it took 35 minutes to go up. The reason was I wanted to listen to a sermon of an associate vicar in Holy Trinity, Brompton, Cambridge. And I so enjoyed it, he preached on two words, our Father. And what he said was this. He said that so often we highlight the forgiveness of God instead of the adoption into God's family. We are adopted into God's family. And I love that thought. I got so much out of that preaching that I was really glad. I knew the preaching was going to be 35 minutes. So I timed it perfectly so I could listen to the whole message. And also, I missed two badgers, which was part of, which was good, because I drove slower, and I managed to avoid the badgers. But it's a great thing that we are Christians today. We're under the shelter of God's wings, and we are loved by God. Secondly, is, I love verse two. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. 
There's three names of God there. You'll notice the Bible does not highlight, sorry, the translations do not highlight them. But the three names of God is this. The first is Elohim, Elohim. The next is El Yon, and the next is El. So David in these three names of God is bringing something of the might and the majesty of the most high God. What a thought that is. The God that we trust. And I encourage us and I encourage myself, study your Bible, discover God. Discover the names of God. And as you discover the names of God, we can sing that hymn, How Great Is Our God. He is Elohim, fullness of might. He is Elion, the most high. He is El, the majestic God. And I love what David says, who fulfills his purpose for me. Everything was against David in the cave here. He did not know if he would see tomorrow. He was trusting in God. But David's confidence is in God's plan for his life. As a hymn that I grew up singing in the meeting I grew up, and it was written by Paul Gerhardt, a German who during the, the 30 years of war in the 17th century had to flee his home with his wife. He was in an inn hiding, and there his wife broke down crying in distress. He, he took the Bible out and he read the Bible, but he too at night went back out into the garden and he was distressed and he wept in the garden. And through that experience, he wrote that hymn, through waves, through cloud and storms, God gently clears the way. And one of the verses of that hymn is this, we leave it to himself to choose and to command. With wonder filled, we soon shall see how wise how strong his hand. But that's not always the case. It's not always the case that in our lives, uh, the cave experiences are when adversity happens in our life that we can understand. But the day is coming, I believe, when we stand before the Lord that we will understand. But sometimes we do understand why God allows things in our life and we can see a purpose in them. I want to recommend a book. Some of you have said you like when I recommend books. My Father, Maker of the Trees, How I Survived the Rwandan Genocide. This is a conversion. In this book is a conversion of a young man, 16, called Mugabo. Now, he was orphaned. And what happened was he went along to church one Sunday and a blind man came to preach and he said, there is a reason why I'm blind. There is a reason why I was born like this. Maybe you are here and I've been through something that has deeply hurt you, but there is a reason for it. Magabo hadn't heard someone speak of suffering in this way before. He listened intently. Then the spirit whispered, there is a purpose to be found in your suffering. He then allowed his mind to wonder why God wanted him to survive. He allowed his heart to say, perhaps God does want to be my father. He went forward and asked Jesus Christ into his life. Magabo now shares his story with other orphans. He shares in this book, in the story, it's a and that you can read it of how he shares with the orphans that he meets. He, take, he says, I take great comfort in knowing a servant God who is in control. That evil can never overcome good no matter how bleak life can be. God is firmly and unquestionably in control. He is infinite. I am finite. And in his infinite wisdom, the way God allowed my mother to escape the ills of genocide was to find ultimate healing in heaven. For me and my brothers, God found it wise to not yet take us from our earthly home. Perhaps in part so we might tell our story of God's great grace and providence. And he goes on to say, to share how he shares, because I was once an orphan, and now as God has taken me as his son, I too can be a father to orphans and point them to my heavenly father. And it's a great, read this book. My father maker of the trees. But David here, unlike last week when his faith is very weak, David in the cave is saying this. The God who fulfills his purpose to me. 
I love these words. And we can each come to God today and we can say, Lord, I cannot understand the cave experience. I cannot understand my, my why such an illness is allowed. I cannot understand that sorrow in my life. I cannot understand this family problem. I cannot understand, Lord, but I do believe this, that you are the God who fulfills his purpose for me. Christians, can we say that with confidence this morning? Let me say this to young Christians today. When you put God first in your life, God will fulfill his purpose for your life. I say that to each of us. We trust the God and we can say with confidence who fulfills his purpose for me. Verse three to four is God's confidence in David's confidence in God's power is verse three to four. When he says he will send from heaven, he doesn't say how. He will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness, how he's going to be rescued, whether it's an angel or someone or God himself. He doesn't say. But what struck me about this was when I thought of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. I thought he was not under the shelter of God's protection, but he was exposed to the wrath of God. And there upon the cross, God did not send out like David said, he will send from heaven and save me. God did not send out to save his son, but God in these three hours upon the cross, he forsook his son and the Lord Jesus experienced the wrath of God for us. Christians, what a savior Jesus is. And he finishes in verse five by saying, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over the earth. And this is David's love for God coming out here. I love these words of David. He just, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And then verse six to 11 is words that, I find these really incredible verses, verses six to 11. Because as F.B. Meyer says, David rose above personal grief and a desire for God's glory. There's a few uh, names that come to mind. You will have read Helen Barren, or Barren, who, was, I think it was in Ethiopia, she was put into a metal container along with other women, Christian women, and in that container were lice and heat and fleas and everything, she decided there she would sing. And there are so many testimonies. I've one here of Pastor Ong Sufal, sat in a filthy Cambodian prison, badly beaten. His hand and feet were chained for five months. Only my mouth was unchained, he said. So I sang to God in prison all the time. Another one here is Archbishop Dominic Tang, spent 22 years in prison in China for his faith. He said, besides my prayer and my meditation, every day I sang some hymns and I saw a voice, Jesus, I live for you. Jesus, I die for you. Jesus, I belong to you. This is amazing. And that's why I find David amazing because David here is saying these words in verse six. In verse seven, he says, my heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. It means it's fixed. He's unresolved in his trust for God, but he's saying something more than that. He said, in the cave, I'm going to sing and make melody like Archbishop Dominic Tang, like the Cambodian pastor, like Helen Barain. And when you think of David, where was David destined for? David was destined for the throne, for to reign, for the palace. That's where David expected to be. But now he's in a cave, his life in danger, and David is singing and making melody. Do you not find that amazing? I find when I'm passing through struggles and worries, I find the last thing I want to do is to sing. David here is singing. Awake my glory, he said. Awake everything that's in me that's good. He said, all that's in me, I'm going to awake. 
And I'm going to awake a harp and lyre. He's going to take his, his harp and his lyre and he's going to take them because they're lifeless till they're played. And he says, I'm going to awaken the dawn. David isn't deciding to get up in the morning and the first thing to do is to go for his iPhone. He's not deciding to go and put on coffee. He's not deciding to do anything like that. David is planning out his day. How do you plan out your morning? I, w- I wouldn't be allowed to sing. I get around if I sing at night in the kitchen. I said, well, I'm singing, I'm happy. And my wife says, well, get out of tune and it sounds awful. I'm not allowed to sing, but never mind. Here is David and he's waking and he's deciding that in the morning he is going to awaken the dawn. And instead of the dawn awakening David, as the sun rises and comes into the cave, David's out to the mouth of the cave and he says, I am going to sing and make melody. And he gives his reason in verse 9 to 10. I will give thanks to you, Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. He wants the people, he wants the nations to hear. What does he want them to hear? How great is our God. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. And if you look at verse 9, here is another name for God. It's O Lord, which is Adoniah, which means supreme authority or power of God. It means master or owner. And I love that with David. There he is in the cave. And he's looking up to heaven. He's looking up at the clouds and the heavens. And he's thinking of the God as we read in Psalm 93 to begin our service. He's looking up and he's looking up and he says, addresses God as Adoniah. The Lord reigns. Honestly, I see some few sleeping. It is warm, but it's better to be warm and cold. So those that are sleeping, just carry on sleeping. I won't be long. That's the water done. On Thursday night at our prayer meeting, all I had asked, do you want a hymn? And I'd said, I don't think so, uh, because he would let Irene know to play the hymn. But in the prayer meeting, Carl mentioned in prayer. Do you know, I love the prayer meeting on Thursday night. I always love, I found this experience my whole life. Sometimes I feel down and I feel a bit... And yet you go to the prayer meeting and I always come out uplifted. And Carl prayed in a prayer, the prayer of David in Chronicles, in whose hand is power and might. And we finished and immediately I thought we will finish. And I didn't play and we sang in church, we stood to sing. Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all. And I will not fear, for this truth remains, that my God is the ancient of days. Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all. And that's what David is saying. David is looking up and he's saying here, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. His eyes are fixed up to God. And he's looking up and he says, your love and your faithfulness, it's endless. David knows how God's love rescued him spiritually and physically. And God's faithfulness has preserved him. And Christians today, we, can, we should be the same. We should have a song. Why? Because God's steadfast love to us and his faithfulness in our lives. And then he finishes with, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. God, high and lifted up beyond all the sun and the clouds and the stars of space, was one. God was exalted in majesty. And David finishes this psalm. Psalm 1 to 5. Psalm, sorry, 57 verse 1 to 5 is prayer. And verse 6 to 11 is praise. And what we find in that psalm is this. 
is David's not being pushed under the waves of adversity. David is not allowing the storm to crush him. David's not silently holding his hands between his head. We find a man, as the hymn says, he's lost in wonder, love and praise in that cave. He's worshiping God, he's praying and he's praising. And what we're seeing in David is this. We're seeing David's faith triumphant. David is not being defeated in the cave. His faith in God is triumphant. That's like last week I've read, I've mentioned in the past few weeks of the South African family who served in Afghanistan, who she, her husband and her two daughters were martyred in 2014. I listened to her speak, it was so moving. And she said these words, I believe, this is how words I wrote down, I believe God is sovereignly in control. What have you? It's faith triumphing. Uh, Elizabeth, this is, <coughs> we were up in Cromarty. I did say the Cromarty stories would end in December, so we're still in October. But in Cromarty, we went round the graveyard. And I love spending time in graveyards. And I just took my time and I came to this one. And there was the dad and the mum, and they lived in their 80s. And their only son, family, was lost at sea as a young man. And underneath they put these words, thy will be done. And I thought, faith triumphing in the storm in the face of adversity. And you know, as I look around this church this morning, and I see what many of you, and I've gotten to know you, and I said this recently, what I've found your example to me has been this, is your faith has triumphed through great sorrow and great adversity and great trials in your life. And for me, you've been such an example. And maybe you're asking, as we come to an end, how can we, how can we have faith that triumphs like David when we feel our world is turned upside down? We feel our backs against the wall. We feel like just giving up in the cave. We feel like just crushed in the cave. We feel so wounded in the cave. We feel as if God has forgotten us about us in the cave. How can we have a faith that triumphs like David is to realize this today, is that you and I, are unconditionally loved by God, that we are believers on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are God's treasure, we are the apple of his eye, and God has a unique plan in his life, and the part of the, his plan for my life and your life is to allow us to go into the caves and allow us to feel crushed, allow us to feel Allow us to feel like we feel, but remember that God is there with us. And like David, we pray to God and we praise the God who will fulfill his unique plan in our life. I want to close with the words of a hymn, the last, a verse of a hymn, and then I'll pray. All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to fear beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort. Here by faith in him to dwell. For I know Whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. Our God, today we pray that you will take Psalm 57 that reminds us that you are the God who cares for us. Lord, lift us today. Lord, let our eyes be like David, lifted up to you. There is still one king reigning over all. 
I thank you for the day in my life that you saved me. And each of us as Christians here today, we are so grateful that we are believers on the Lord Jesus. And we are so grateful that you have us under, the, under your wings protecting us. We thank your God that your purpose will be fulfilled in our lives. We love you, our God. And we want others to know you, to know this joy, to know this peace, to know this hope that we have in you. We pray, our God, today for someone in this church who's never yet bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus, who has never yet trusted in the Lord Jesus. Oh, our God, save them today, we pray. Help us all, our God. Help us. Strengthen our faith, we pray. And as we sing our final hymn, what words they are. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>